Hello, my name is Kyle Orr. Today's day is March 27, 2018, and I am interviewing Dr. Mohammed Sabar Barami on the Ball State campus as part of the Virginia B. Ball Center Seminar, Muslims in Muncie. Dr. Barami, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come back. I want to begin by asking, where and when were you born? I was uh, born uh, in a small province called Lagman, L-A-G-H-M-A-N, uh, and I lived in that province up to sixth grade. Then at my sixth grade, our home and our village uh, became underwater because they were building a dam. Uh, it was mostly by Russians at that time. At that time, they called it Soviet Union. And then we have to migrate to a different province, which was in the vicinity, very close, called Nangrahar, N-A-N-G-A-H-A-R, Nangrahar province, where the capital is Jalalabad. So uh, uh, then the rest of the time we lived there, and then I went to uh, Nangrahar, Lycee, they call it Lycee, L-Y-C-E-E, which is Nangrahar uh, High School. And this was in Jalalabad from seventh grade uh, all the way to 12th grade. Uh, in your interview for the Facing Project, you talk about your mother's unwavering support and sacrifice. Would you tell me a little bit about your relationship with her? With who? Your mother? Yeah, yeah I think uh, I, I was uh, around five maybe, I'm not 100% sure, but close to that, uh, that my father died. I do not remember my father. The only thing I remember when he died, I don't, I'm not sure whether this was actually, I remembered it or my mother told me when he was in, uh, when he was, you know, when, when he was dead and, you know, uh, putting under the coffin and things like that. So sometimes I imagine, but otherwise I do not remember my, uh, my father. Uh, I was raised uh, by mother, my, by my mother. And uh, my relation with my mother has been extremely unique because she was my father, father and my mother. And uh, in those years, uh, you know, 60 years ago, now I'm 65, that was six years ago, when you take five at age five, uh, being raised by your mother in Afghanistan, a widow, to raise a child on her own, it's like a biting on a rock because there are not even jobs for, you know, for men and leave alone uh, for women. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when you don't have any resources. Uh, and I actually, at that time, we lived in a village by the Afghan, Afghan standard, they call it a poor village. So you can imagine how poor that village would be that the rest of the villages around that village call it a poor village. So this is where, where I was born and this I was raised. And um, I believe maybe I was in six, six years old that my mother put me in school. And at that time, the school was not very popular at all. A lot of people who were uh, the, the head of the villages and things like that, they would not want to put their children in school because they thought if you put them in school, these kids would lose their faith and they would become corrupted, you know, all kind of misunderstanding. And I was put in by my mother and uh, I think the first year I got sick, so she got me out. But my mother, and my mother was so courageous and uh, I had so much vision that I still am wonder where that vision came from, uh, that she put me again for the second time in first grade. And the other good thing was, at that time, uh, uh, in that village, I have to walk quite much. It wasn't uh, close to our village. I have to walk at least one hour, you know, to go to school. And at that time, they call it a village school. A village school used to be three years. That's it. But then, when I get to the third year, luckily, the village school converted to a primary school, which was up to sixth grade. And that is, that is why I went all the way to sixth grade, and then at that time, uh, uh, the village came under the water when they built 
the dam, and that's why we moved to the uh, neighboring uh, province, and then I went to a high school, and I have to take an exam. So my relation with my mother, uh, when I even now thinking about uh, uh, about my mother, I think the more I'm getting older, the more I appreciate my mother, the more I appreciate her vision, the more I appreciate her uh, insight to education. Uh, even when I was in that village, every morning she would wake me up early in the morning to go to one of the mosques in the neighboring villages. If he didn't have a mullah or a preacher, and if another village had a good preacher, she would let me go there to learn Quran and to learn some basic of the religion. And I believe probably I've been to minimum six, seven different villages early in the morning to go there and get some uh, teaching and then come home uh, and eat whatever breakfast could be available and then walk to school and sometimes no shoes. And uh, then when I would come in back from school, uh, even at age five, six, whatever my mother was doing, for example, if she would be working in the field, I would, uh, I would uh, help out. I would be there with her. Uh, and how she uh, made a living, she would make a hat. You know, people would be wearing hat. Uh, she would make that. She made a basket. Uh, she made clothes for people. And she also worked in the, in, uh, 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 on the farm as well for whoever. And I couldn't help her with basket or, showing, or, or sewing clothes or sewing hat, uh, but I would help her in the, uh, in the farm. So uh, that was our relation. And we live in a very small one room. I think probably was the, the size of the room was maybe uh, not more than uh, 10 by 10 feet. And that was our, uh, uh, you know, house and that was our uh, laundry place, that was our uh, kitchen, and that, that this is what it was. So how did Islam shape your family practices growing up? How, how did? How did Islam shape your family practices growing up? Oh, you, family practice, you mean, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a physician? No, uh, when you were growing up, how did Islam Oh, shape affected my, uh, I think for early on, uh, uh, going to the different mosques, and as you know, uh, Islam and Christianity, all the religion, especially the, the Ibrahiminic religion, uh, Jewish, uh, Judaism, and Islam, and uh, Christianity, we all believe they're coming from the only supreme God, only God, one God, that's it. No, no other gods and no other uh, relation to it. And so the basics are the same. So early on, I uh, was taught about the, the Ten Commandments. And also, especially from my mother, I was taught uh, uh, when she was sending me to different mosques to learn uh, the basic of Islam, the basic of faith, uh, the basic belief, and to be uh, a good person, a good human being, to respect the elders and to be kind to the youngers and to continue to work hard, make a living, not to extend your hand to others, not to rely on others, unless for some emergency, but to rely on God and rely on yourself. So early on, when I saw my mother also, you know, working that hard, being a woman and not relying on any man or any of her relatives or anybody else, so that uh, uh, taught me uh, uh, the principle of hard work and the principle of uh, uh, working uh, hard uh, both from religious standpoint and also in school. And I was always a very good student. Uh, I was probably number second student when I was uh, going to primary school. And, and uh, in uh, uh, high school, I was uh, number one from seventh grade all the way to 12th grade. So basically uh, religion, uh, especially my mother's teaching, did shape me who I am. I love people, I love to serve, like nowadays I love especially elders, and that is why I'm now the medical director of uh, five nursing homes. 
and assisted living. I'm the medical director of hospice. If you know what hospice, I'm the medical director of home health care. So because I love people, and I believe that also has been shaped by my religion. Because, you know, when you worship God, God doesn't need our worship. What he says to worship me means to worship uh, his creation. Whether they are human beings, or whether there could be animals, whether this is earth, the air, the water that we drink, so that we have to be very respectful for, you know, of all of our surroundings, our neighbors, our parents, our children, our uh, younger people. So uh, Islam has been a very, very important, uh, has played a very important role in my life when I was growing up and even now. As a matter of fact, sometimes when I compare, my faith was much even stronger when I was your age, when I was younger, going to high school, even to college. My, I had a much, much stronger faith, even my relation with, uh, with God, which we, in Arabic, they call it Allah, which is the same God. Uh, but uh, I'm still uh, very thankful uh, uh, to God that has guided me, and I'm always asking for his guidance. Continuous uh, requests from God to guide my life. So you've spoken a little bit already about your education in Afghanistan, and I understand that you studied in, a, in America briefly for high school. Can you tell me about uh, how you came to study in America? Yeah, I believe when John F. Kennedy uh, uh, become a president, uh, he uh, popularized the Peace Corps movement, Peace Corps movement. And I don't remember exactly what year was it, but it was 1963, 64 in that uh, time. Uh, there was also, they call it foreign, uh, they call it American Field Service, AFS. American Field Service, which will be very clear uh, 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 example of that will be uh, foreign exchange student. Nowadays we have, like I'm part of Rotary Club, we have a student of a Rotary Club, and a lot of high school they have a foreign exchange student. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I came to America, uh, my American family, one of their daughter had gone to Holland before I came, and when I came to America, their son, which was my age, just returned from Brazil. Uh, so he he went to Brazil, and he was talking about Portuguese. At that time, I remember that Brazil does not speak Spanish, they speak Portuguese. So uh, when I went to high school, uh, from seventh grade all the way to 11th grade, when I was in 11th grade, uh, in order to, to be qualified, for this AFS, American Field Service, they they would gather the top three students from different 11th grade of, of the whole province. Uh, I don't remember how many students were there, probably could be 60, 70 students, maybe more. I don't remember the exact number. So those many students from different high school in that province and the uh, neighboring provinces uh, brought them and they would give them exam and the exam included not only English but also some basic uh, math and science and obviously English as well uh, and uh, luckily I, I was uh, number one in that exam and then two other people among three of us one did not make it through the interview but uh, my friend who now lives in Utah his name is Omar, O-M-A-R, he and I make it. So I, then I came to Sedalia, Missouri. When I was coming, I talked to my principal to see what is more popular. He said probably agriculture. So I <laughs> mentioned my note that I want to be, I want to, uh, when I grow up, I want to go to agriculture college. So that's why they put me with a family who lived a little bit away from Sedalia, Missouri. This is... Uh, uh, probably one and a half hour southeast, southeast of Kansas City. So I uh, then I lived with the, my American family. I came in August of 1970. Then I lived, I think it was uh, the next early August or maybe July of 1971. So I lived with an American, American family. So the reason how I, how, the requirement was to take the exam and uh, 
and then you go through interviews. As a matter of fact, I think I uh, want to tell you some uh, interesting story. When I passed the exam, I went home, and uh, at that time, some of my other relatives, uh, my uncle from father's side, they, they told me to go back to Jalalabad, which is the capital of the Nangrahar, Nangrahar province, to tell the delegation of uh, foreign exchange students and tell them not to come because, you know, uh, that you shouldn't be going. But my mother stood up, he said, nobody can ever stop my son. Nobody can stop my son from going anywhere he wants to and whatever he wants. I know my son, I have a confidence in him, who he is, I have raised him the right way. Where he goes to America or anywhere else, I trust him. So when I went back to Jalalabad, I remember I took one of my cousins with me. So instead of telling the delegation not to come, <laughs> we helped them to come to my house. And uh, then, you know, they had some question and they talked to us and, and obviously uh, I was accepted. So this is how I came to, uh, as an AFS, American Field Service student, uh, to uh, Sedalia, Missouri. And in Sedalia, Missouri, at that time it was very nice because there, at that time there were not too many uh, foreign exchange students. There was uh, uh, not too much diversity. So I was like a, um, you know, uh, a champion. Uh, everybody were quite excited and to see me. They will be asking you questions. They will be stopping me there and things like that. And the other amazing story about that is uh, uh, my uh, American family in Sydney, Missouri, they thought Afghanistan was in, uh, in uh, Africa. So they were very concerned. Not that because I will be black, not because, because my American mother was a, uh, uh, she was a nurse, very open-minded. My American father was a little bit prejudiced, but my American father, American mother was very open-minded. The reason they were concerned, if I would be black at that time, you know, there was a quite much uh, tension between black and white and, and school segregation and all of those situations. And there was some problem even in Smith, Smith Cotton High School. This is one of the high schools that they had in Sedalia, Missouri. Uh, but then they finally went to library and they look at uh, <laughs> that Afghanistan was not in Africa, Afghanistan was in Central Asia. And then they had a big sigh because when I came they told me how that was very interesting. So that tells you how much little, how much little uh, even educated people knew about other countries. Because America is very isolated, you know. Uh, Isolate, so they did not know much about other countries at all. So this was another interesting. But I had a very good, nice year uh, as a high school. I was uh, uh, very social. I would give uh, talk to uh, the different uh, clubs uh, in the high school, and uh, then I graduated. I had a diploma from Smith Cotton High School. Uh, then I went back uh, before we are going. Before we were going back to uh, Afghanistan. We, they gave us a tour. I think uh, we went to Ohio. I remember Cleveland, then we went to even, uh, then we went even to Washington, D.C. And the amazing thing was in Washington, D.C., I had a two Peace school teacher at high school. One was English, one was math. By that time, when I came here to America, they were also here. And, and I found them in uh, Washington, D.C., and then invited me, we had a nice dinner. Uh, Omar and I and, and my Peace School teachers, then after that we left back to, uh, to Afghanistan. So the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979. How did this affect you? Uh, that is uh, uh, amazingly and apparently a very sad situation. That's why the Afghan people, you know, when you say Afghan, I mean the citizen of Afghanistan being called Afghans. The Afghans are suffering for more than 35 years because of that, uh, 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 that kind of invasion, especially some of the big countries uh, sometimes take uh, on small countries. Even the United States has been uh, uh, guilty of that as well. Uh, but uh, the Russian uh, uh, invaded Afghanistan. Uh, actually, they in installed uh, a puppet government in Afghanistan in April of 78. 
but then they officially invaded Afghanistan in, uh, in December of 1979, which most of the uh, uh, young students in Balstead were not born. Uh, <clears throat> when I went back to uh, Afghanistan in the end of July, I did miss the entering exam to college. Uh, and the entering exam to colleges, all high school graduates take one exam and on one day in different provinces at the same time. And I missed it because I think that they gave that exam in June and I arrived late in July, so I missed that exam. So I went ahead and uh, took uh, uh, exam on my, uh, of high school. I have to take the high school exam again of the 12th grade. I went ahead and get the 12th grade exam, both Omar, my friend, and I, and we passed. Then we could not go to college because the college exam was, was done. Then we have to look for jobs. My friend, he found a job in Jalalabad, but I went to Kabul, and then I got a job uh, in WHO, that is World Health Organization that is part of United Nations. And uh, I work uh, with them for almost uh, uh, close to maybe 18 months or so till the time came to take again the entry exam to the university. And I did take that exam and I got my uh, first uh, choice and that was Kabul Medical School. We also had another medical school in Jalalabad. Uh, in my hometown area, but uh, I chose Kabul Medical School. Uh, maybe it was a little bit more advanced. And uh, after I, uh, the, high, the medical school in Afghanistan is seven years. The first year is the general science, physics, chemistry, biology, and math. And then uh, the first the two other years are some other basic uh, uh, science, mostly biochemistry, uh, phys physiology, uh, all the other basic science that is uh, relevant to uh, uh, medical school. Then the last uh, three more years is, uh, is uh, uh, mostly uh, you going part-time to the hospital and part-time you study about all clini clinical, all the diagnosis, uh, things like that. When I was in the last year after finishing medical school, you have to go to a rotational internship two months in surgery, two months in uh, uh, OBGYN, two months surgery, one month in uh, radiology, one month in dermatology, eye, different things. So it was then, in the end of December, that the Russian invaded. And after that, they put me in jail. Uh, and I said, why? I mean, I'm the poor student. I'm uh, the son of a widow. I am a very good student, hardworking, man, uh, even I, I, I work and got some money from working with WHO that I didn't, I never asked any money from anybody after I, after 11th grade. Uh, I was just self-sufficient and relied on my own. Uh, but I believe the reason was twofold. One was I was, um, I had been to uh, United States of America as a foreign exchange student, uh, AFS we called it. And uh, secondly, probably they want to pressure me to join, you know, some good student to join uh, uh, the Communist Party. Uh, but after releasing me, then, uh, 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 and after graduating, completing my uh, medical school, then I had to find way, and then I tried to escape through a river uh, to join a freedom fighters, because you have to go through mountains and the mountain, the only people were there, the freedom fighters who were fighting the Russians and the Afghan communist government uh, at that time. Uh, so, and uh, when, when, even before Russian invasion, invaded in 1979, even from 1978, when the communist government was in, installed by the help of Russia, uh, uh, even at that time, every night we will be afraid and scared. Either tonight the communists will take us to jail and kill us, or tomorrow, because a lot of people, who, of some of our friends, were taken and we never saw them back. Some of them were died uh, or killed on the spot. Some of them were buried alive uh, of that kind of a situation. Because when the communists took over Afghanistan, what they were interested, 
I have heard it on my own ears. They said, we want one good, one million good communist Afghans. We don't care about all, all these other 16 or 17 other Afghans. If they all die, so what? We just need a good bunch of communists to be in Afghanistan. So this was their philosophy. So killing non-communists for them was uh, easier than killing flies. So that was the, that was the mentality of, of, the, uh, of the communists, especially of the Afghan communists. And also in many other countries, when, uh, if, if they have taken the, the, when, they ta when they have taken, the communists have taken over, probably they will have a similar uh, examples and similar feeling and similar experience. So uh, then if you want me to tell you about uh, uh, what I did with the freedom fighters, so I lived in caves, caves. Before even I uh, joined the freedom fighters, I was almost drowned in the river because I, when I was young, I knew how to swim. I thought I still am able to swim. And this was after several years. Uh, then I almost was drowned. I have a cousin with me from my mother's side, cousin, who, who was a very good swimmer, and he encouraged me. We had a pile of bush, dry pile, you know, that you put it under your stomach, and I was putting my weight on it. And when you put your weight on it, I was drowned. So he recognized, and he quickly, Sabir, Sabir, you have to hold it by your two hands and push this pile of dry bush that we tied it tight, push it this way, you can make it. And uh, luckily, you know, I made it. But uh, I was swallowing water uh, like crazy and coughing, and I was already felt that I will die. To be very frank with you, in that minute, I did not care that much about my death. I was thinking about my mother, that I'm the only child, and she worked so hard, and I will be dead, and the fish will be eating me, and my mother was thinking that to send my son to a safe place. But anyway, so I made it, thanks God, and then I joined, I, I went to the mountain, I joined the freedom fighters. Uh, at that time, one of my cousins was with the freedom fighters uh, temporarily. So I lived in caves. And the only thing we ate with the caves was uh, bread and lentil. Occasionally, after uh, you know two months, somebody may give us a, a goat. Uh, uh, you know, uh, most of the time it was a goat. Sometimes maybe sheep. Occasionally, uh, that you can have a meat every you know every uh, two months or every three months or every six weeks, things like that. And we lived in caves. Uh, uh, and sometimes you will be so afraid that not to be. Uh, seen by the Russian reconnaissance, reconnaissance uh, airplane, you know, because they could bombard you. Uh, and I work as a, as, a, as a doctor for them. And uh, uh, I think I went with the two battles, you know, uh, and there was one time uh, I was, uh, still have my medicine bag with me. I had a, a Kalashinkov with me, and I was going toward uh, uh, an area, I thought these were freedom fighters. When we went closer, we seeing that those are Russians already took over in that place at night. And then we turn around, and then I'm seeing these bullets, shings and shings, bullets from this way and that way. I, I, this was another time that I said, oh my gosh, you know, any bullets can hit me and I'll be dead. But thanks God I survived, then we went far away. Then after that, that our center came under big attack, then uh, some people were going to Pakistan, so I joined them, then I went to Pakistan after 10 months of being, uh, 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 being in the caves. So that, that was an amazing experience, and, uh, 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 and you can see uh, that will also shape my life uh, to think about others, uh, how blessed I am today and uh, uh, I owe it to the Lord, I owe it to my faith, and that's why I have to uh, do whatever I can to share with those people that have been unfortunate, because I was one of them, as I didn't have shoes, I didn't have food, I didn't have clothes, and plus I could be dead. I could be dead and could be killed several times. If I'm still alive, it's not that I'm too smart, it's not that I'm too intelligent. It is not that I'm, uh, I did any specific trick. 
No, the Lord, Allah, God, maybe have some purpose for me. And that purpose is to serve his people, to serve his community, to serve his earth, and to serve the animal, to serve whatever, like I mentioned before, whatever I could do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm thankful uh, to the Lord that he has given me that opportunity to continue to serve here Mansi community as their physician and also back home uh, in, in Afghanistan, but not only in Afghanistan, with the people who are suffering in Syria, people are suffering in Africa, people are suffering in Burma, uh, Myanmar they call it, you know, or uh, any other places. Are people here homeless people? They're homeless. They don't, don't have to be Muslims. They're, they're, you know, creation of Allah. You know, they're God's people. So this is my short story about, uh, uh, you know, that part of life and then uh, living in caves, being part of the freedom fighters. Uh, and then, you know, obviously when I went to Pakistan, do you want me to elaborate on that as well? Or do you have uh, other burning questions you can ask? Uh, so I think I will leave you what, to see what your questions are. Just, uh, I just briefly, briefly want to know how you came from being in a refugee camp, refugee camp in Pakistan to being a physician in Muncie. Yeah, the, that is also, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, all these stories are related. And if you really think about it, that's why I make my faith even stronger. When I was in refugee camps, I worked as uh, a uh, volunteer uh, uh, as a physician uh, in the camps. I had a, we had a clinic that was free for the refugee people. Uh, we worked there. Uh, and this is where I met my uh, uh, wife. Our family knew each other, and then we also got engaged. Uh, so I worked uh, there for probably one and a half, close to one, half, one year and some months. Uh, and then I wrote to my American family. Do you remember that I told you that I was a foreign exchange student? I wrote to my American family that I'm here as a refugee and uh, 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 they sponsored me through a Lutheran uh, church. And uh, uh, I think it was end of September, maybe it was in the fall. I don't remember the exact date that I came as a, this time I didn't come as a foreign exchange student. This time I came as a refugee refugee from Afghanistan, joined my American family, and I was with my American family for close to a month or six weeks, tried to look for a job. It was very difficult to find a job in, uh, in um, Missouri. Then I knew a doctor, his name was Dr. Shaw, S-H-A-W, American thoracic surgeon, very wonderful man. He died now. I still have his love in my heart. He loved Afghanistan. He always would tell me, he said, uh, when will be the day that Afghanistan will be free of Russia that he can go back to Afghanistan? But of course, he died and uh, uh, the situation never got cleared. So then when I went to Dallas, he invited me, he sent me a ticket, I went to buy bus, and then I worked at Parkland Hospital as a, as a respiratory therapist. I, my salary was $5.38. Then in the meantime, I took Kaplan courses to refresh all medical school from the beginning. So I worked and sent money to my family in the refugee camps, and to my fiance, to my mother. And in the meantime, I paid my way through Kaplan courses to refresh myself. And then I have to take two exams. Uh, after those two exams, uh, then uh, I could qualify to apply for residency. Uh, and this all I did from the end of 81 till, uh, till mid, till June of 1985, till I was accepted to a residency program here at uh, Ball, uh, Memorial, ha Ball Memorial Hospital here in Muncie, Indiana. This is how I ended up from Missouri going to Dallas to work, Parkland Hospital, which is a very popular hospital, when John F. Kennedy was killed, uh, his body was taken there, and the governor at that time was taken. This is where I uh, I started a respiratory therapist for uh, 15 months. Then I worked in another small hospital as a physician till I passed my exam, till I got accepted to uh, a residency program. And this is how I ended up in June of 1985 here in Muncie. All right, now I want to begin asking you questions about the Islamic community in Muncie specifically. So four years after you arrived, members of the Muslim community here established the Islamic Center of Muncie. Um, 
So what was your role in this? Uh, as I mentioned, I came in June, uh, end of June of 1985, and I got accepted to uh, as a, a intern uh, in residency program, family practice residency, El Bal uh, Memorial Hospital. Uh, and this also has some interesting story, and that is when I uh, first was accepted, uh, they put me on uh, probation. They said, you know, because uh, uh, Afghanistan education was very mediocre, and then I went through so much trauma of uh, being in jail and being with freedom fighters and then here. So, uh, but luckily after six months, everybody was very pleased. So then I was happy as well. Then I applied for my uh, fiance that um, Bibi, uh, you know, to to come to the United States, and then after a year, she joined me. Uh, but when it comes to a community, as, as far as the Islamic uh, Center is uh, concerned, at that time, before that, if I'm not mistaken, they had a room or a place uh, at Ball State University to pray. And I believe it was in 1984, or close to that time, more or less, maybe some other historians would be more accurate on that, uh, they have bought a small church on Ball Avenue. The address was 1717 Ball Avenue. And when I came, uh, the first few months I was not active at all because I wanted to establish myself, especially being on probation and uh, uh, everything new, the medicine, although maybe, uh, maybe I knew materials uh, theoretically, but practically, you know, I have not been as exposed as a uh, you know, working as a respiratory therapist or physician assistant uh, in Dallas. I know here you are a physician and you have to give orders, you have to make a diagnosis, you have to be, you know, the leader and provide. So that's why I was quite uh, foc trying to focus on my education. But after that, I uh, uh, became involved uh, just as a member, you know, just to go and pray, especially on Fridays. And uh, uh, I believe in, uh, by, 19, uh, uh, by the end of 1985, I think they finished the work out by 1986. Then a year or two later, at that time, the Islamic Center was actually governed by the MSA, Muslim Student Association. Uh, the, the members of the community were very few. Uh, you know, there were, we had some African-American uh, community like Amir Shabazz, Rashid Shabazz, Abdurrahman, uh, there was another guy by the name of Bilal, and some others. And then were also we had some professor, a uh, few physicians. So they were also part of the community and they were uh, going to the mosque, but they were not on the governing body. The governing body was completely uh, by the student. I do not remember clearly, was it 1986 or 1987, I remember Dr. Ali, you know, their work on the Constitution, and then we made it such a way that the community will have a part and the student will have a part. Like the president should be from the community and the treasurer should be the community. By that time the community become bigger, so there will be, the center will be more financially viable. and. Uh, uh, then I think I was chosen uh, the first president of the community, uh, non-student president uh, of the community. And through the years, I believe when I calculated, I have been president off and on for close to 15 years. Uh, although I think my wife thought it was nine years, but when I recalculated, it was 15 years off and on since 1985. Uh, so, and at that time, we tried to, uh, we, we had a small community, we have people uh, from Bangladesh, almost six family. There was a two or three doctors, two or three other professors. We had a, a two or three Egyptian family. We had a family from uh, 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 other African countries, uh, like Libya, you know, one professor uh, from Afghanistan. We had a, uh, a guy from Carl Faiz, uh, Muhammad Faiz, who also got his master degree his master's degree from, uh, in English from uh, Ball State, and then he went back to Afghanistan. And I knew of him because his brother was my classmate in high school. So he was there. So, uh, and then we uh, 
try to bring uh, the community be part of the governing body and will also continue to have a good relation with the MSA, Muslim Student Association, and also to have a good relation with our indigenous Muslim population, which is our African-American uh, families. So uh, the mosque or the center was very small, a small church, but we had a great time. Uh, every month we will have a monthly dinner. It will be crowded because it will look crowded and everybody will bring a delicious food. Then we would have a speaker. And uh, as far as the Juma prayer, that's a Friday prayer. Like in Christianity will be Sunday and in uh, for the Jewish people will be Saturday. For the Muslim, for Muslims, it's a Friday prayer. Since we did have a preacher, we are a very small community. We didn't have the finances to to hire a full time uh, imam. We call it imam, like a preacher, you know, like a leader, religious leader. So what we did was there will be like a few of us, four or five, whoever want to volunteer, to give the sermon sermon on the Friday prayer. And I will also, from the beginning, be part of the, the sermon. And Brother Amir Shabazz, which you might have a question about his role, and he was, uh, you know, another one. And there were several other brothers who will be part of this group to lead the Friday prayer, and in the meantime, to give a sermon. Uh, and we also establish a, we call it a Sunday school. Uh, some of those uh, family members who were here, even some students who were here, some of the students who were married, and they had, a, I remember specifically, uh, there was a, one student from Malaysia. Uh, he had been here for a long time, and he had his wife, and his, he had a son, and his son's name was also Yusuf, uh, like my son, and some other family members, including myself. At that time, we started family afterward, and uh, to have a to have a Sunday classes for the students. And then uh, uh, Friday prayers, and then we had a monthly dinners, and then obviously we encourage people to come five times. If they couldn't come five times, at least to come once or twice uh, for the, you know, to the mosque to keep the, the center alive and to keep the community alive and to keep the community dynamic, small community to be together because our only common uh, denominator was our religion because otherwise people from Asia, people from uh, uh, Europe, or people from Africa, uh, from Middle East, uh, you know, I think, you know, from all different countries, even from Far East, Malaysia. At that time we had a bunch of students from Malaysia. One time we had a 10, 15 girls and students, they were uh, studying actuarial science uh, from Indonesia. We had students. So the main common denominator was uh, our faith religion to bring us all together so we try to keep that brotherhood and sisterhood alive and together to keep the community going how did the community practice ramadan back then at that time that was uh, uh, i'm very proud of this community uh, to be one thing that i'm very grateful to the wives of our community members uh, because from the beginning since i have been, been remembering in the month of Ramadan, uh, uh, since I was the president, I will take it upon myself. I will talk to each sister, <laughs> I will call it a, our Muslim sister, I will call them, I will go to their house. Could you volunteer to take, uh, let's say, Monday to provide uh, iftar, we call it, iftar. That is the breaking uh, of the fasting in the evening, the food to provide, you know, each Monday to families or one family, or whoever can afford it. Uh, then, for example, we, Bibi, my wife, we will take one day on our own. Just, you know, Bibi is the excellent cook, so that was not a problem. Uh, any, time, any day that other people didn't want, we will take that day. Because uh, although Bibi was raising children and things like that, but Bibi has a big heart, and she's an excellent cook, she's a hardworking woman, so she said, no problem. Whatever day other people cannot take, then we will take. So what we will did was we will talk to one family to take, or two families to take Monday, two other families Tuesday, another family Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday we will make it like a monthly dinner. 
each Saturday, everybody will bring food and we will make break the, the fasting together. And Sunday will be another family to take home. So this, we, we did it this for uh, almost uh, recently, I think in the last two years in our new Islamic center, we changed it. We changed it to volunteer. Now we put a list uh, and, you know, people fill it out, whatever they do. But that also worked for us very, very well because our community was very small and, uh, and I appreciate those ladies. So we had, a, we had a lot of fun. Then what happened uh, in the month of Ramadan, at night we have to, have a, we have to recite the whole Quran in, in, in the whole month. So luckily we will have some students who will be half as half as of the Quran. Means they have memorized. Uh, in later years we have we had a guy from Saudi Arabia, his name was Qutb, and he will sometimes he will uh, read the Quran from his memory, like chapter chapter every night, till we finish it by the end of night. And sometimes they could read it from the from the Quran itself. So we had a uh, we had an excellent time in the month of Ramadan, an ex excellent brotherhood and sisterhood, uh, and the children enjoyed it, adults enjoyed it, women enjoyed it. So we had a we had a great time, and I'm very proud of that because we were very few of the Muslim community because I have our friends in a lot of other places. They would provide food like a monthly, like maybe Saturday and Sunday, but we would have a food every night. How, did, how has the community here dealt with the issue of upholding Islamic burial practices? Islamic what? Burial practices? Yeah, that was a, uh, that was a big dilemma because uh, uh, I believe when I first came in, there was a student from Kuwait who died, and I was not involved. But then, luckily, that they, they wanted to send their body uh, 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 back home. Uh, but since I got involved from from the beginning, uh, uh, I got I got uh, uh, that is also interesting. So, mixed mortuary uh, people uh, are their leadership. I was the doctor of their parents. And then I, I found out they have a funeral home, so I got connected, Bibi and I got connected with them. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, how we got connected with them. Then we found out with Jones Cemetery, which is on 332 close to uh, 69. Uh, then we found out about that, because the, uh, the reason we chose that uh, uh, 69, close to 69, because we had some of our members who were in Anderson. Even some family, family came from Marion. So I thought maybe even if somebody from that group of people died, so they could be easily have access from 69 to 332 to Jones Cemetery. So we we got involved with mixed mortuary, and uh, they, we appreciate them very much. They made a very nice accommodation for us. And then we also, we got uh, with the Jones Cemetery, they gave us a separate section. They have a big section for us. And they said nobody will be allowed to be buried in their section. And recently, they also have uh, allowed us to name our cemetery under the Jones Cemetery that we could put our own uh, our own title, like to call it paradise or something. Uh, uh, it was interesting <laughs> because of all this uh, uh, prejudices, especially after Trump has come to the uh, you know, forefront. He said, maybe we don't need to say Muslim cemetery or something like that. Let's call it a different name, paradise or something, you know, heaven or, you know, whatever, some good name. So, so this is how we, with the mixed mortuary, were very influential in that and helped us a lot. And then we have the Jones Cemetery. Those people were very accommodating and gave us a separate section. And then BB and I are very involved. Uh, like uh, some of the, you know, uh, when a Muslim dies, we have to take them right away to, uh, to the funeral home. We have to wash their body. I have been personally involved in that myself. And then we have to have a different cloth for them, for a mentee, three pair of cloth, for a woman, five pair of cloth. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think it was five, six years ago, there was a, a guy from uh, uh, 
uh, from Africa, Somalia. He went to see his parents. Then he came back to Chicago, and he was driving on 65, going through Indianapolis, then going to 70, Highway 70, and Richmond area, he had accident. Another uh, a big uh, a truck crossed the median and killed him. And at that time, the autopsy thing of Richmond area was done by Ball. Ball, Ball Memorial Hospital. So these policemen or whoever brought the body and they called me and said, Dr. Bahrami, I said, we have this guy, I think he has a Quran in him and his name is Muhammad, what do we do? I said, keep the Quran, the holy book, in a very high place and send him to mixed virtually and I'll take care of it. And I called the rest of the, the group, we already have a place for him, we don't know this guy. We don't even know his relative. Nobody knows his information. Uh, then later we found some people came from Michigan, some people came from Wisconsin, but we went ahead and took care of it. And then later all of those people who came, I brought them to my house and we fed them and then, then they left. So as far as the burial things, uh, I've been personally involved from day number one. Uh, now a lot of other people are helping us. My wife has been involved, especially for the woman because uh, if a woman die, then the woman should give them the washing and put them the cloths around it. And if the men die, so my wife and I are very much involved uh, in the burial uh, 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 rituals of the Muslim uh, community here in in, in Mansi. Now, we, you mentioned Amir Shabazz earlier. Now, in the Islamic Center, there's a plaque commemorating Amir's life. What stands out to you about his contributions? Uh, Amir Shabazz is not only uh, has been uh, 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 appreciated uh, being a leader not only of the Muslim community, I think it's uh, also in, in a Mansi community as a whole. Uh, he was uh, a person that he always uh, uh, stood for the diversity. Uh, he was uh, uh, always stood up for the uh, rights of African American. Uh, he was uh, a very courageous and very knowledgeable man. His mother, uh, Conley, Mrs. Conley, was a very popular person uh, in Muncie. And uh, I, he had worked at Borg Warner, but, um, uh, uh, but he was always civil, what do you call it, civil, leader of uh, civil rights, always has been. So he has been actually missed not only by the Muslim community, but he has been missed by the larger Delaware County community and Muncie community uh, as he was one of those uh, people. He was always the forefront of injustice. If there is always injustice, he will be there. If there was always uh, not fairness, he will be there. Uh, he will be writing to the newspaper. He will be uh, uh, in the in the city hall. He will be communicating with different groups. Uh, so he was he was very he early on he understood his faith and he also understood the depth of the racial divide in this country. Unfortunately, uh, you know what has happened to. Uh, to not only African American community, what happened to our Indian community, what happened to our African American community, Polish community, uh, Catholic community, and now what is happening, unfortunately, to Muslim community, that we are virtually uh, trying to be isolated and being named. So he had a vision and he had a courage that I can see very little courage in other people. Uh, and also, uh, he was also very, very well read about Islam. And he was also one of the guys who will give us a, 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 a lectures or sermon on Fridays. As a matter of fact, one thing is very interesting about Amir Shabazz that I always appreciated. If somebody was, uh, uh, his, it was his turn to give sermon, and either he was late or for, he was not prepared, or some, uh, some situation arises that he could come in. We will call, Brother Amir, could you, give a, could you give us a sermon? And he would be ready on the spot. Uh, 
And I remember one time I told, I said, Amir, to be honest with you, when you prepare sermon, your sermon is always wonderful. But I really love those sermons when you are not prepared. When he would not be prepared and he would get on the stage, we call it member. Member, when religious stage, we call it member. He will stand up and he will give a, a wonderful uh, sermon that you would love to hear it. You would love to hear his sermon, uh, the truth, the justice, the freedom, the fairness, and, 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 and the situation of poverty, the situation of homelessness, the situation of the people who are suffering. Uh, I mean, that you will, he, will, he was so eloquent. He was so good with his, with his uh, vocabulary, the way he would describe it. Sometimes bring, will, will bring tears in your eyes. And he knew because he has been through it. When you have been through it, you know what it means to be homeless. You know what it means when you are uh, being isolated. You know what it means when you are prejudiced again. You know you have the quality, you cannot find jobs, or you cannot because of your color or because of your race. So he was not only, as I said, over and over, he was not the leader of Muslim community, but he was the leader of, of Mansi community. My children always, my children, from Yusuf Hamid, some always call him Uncle Amir. We love Uncle Amir. And he was, another best thing about him was he will always surround himself with young people. He was young, and he would tell them about, you know, teach them about fishing and teach about, and, but he will always give them this idea about hard work and, uh, and will tell them that uh, not to take anything for um, uh, granted. He said you always need to work hard and you need to prove, prove yourself and you need to always ask for your right. He said, even in the best society like in America, compared to other countries, although America has its own bloody hand and, and has had from, from the way it started, but even still, I think compared to many other countries, still the best place to live in America, even in this place, your right has, will be taken away. Like now we can see that Trump is trying to become a dictator, try to take uh, to label Muslim as all of us like terrorists to try and try to uh, energize the anti-Islamic group to be against us. So he always would tell these young people not to take any chances, to be the best student, to be the best person, to be, be the best American, to be the best American, American Muslim, African, whoever you are, to be the best citizen, to be the best, best like I mentioned earlier, to be the best uh, uh, creation of, of God, to serve God by serving his people. Otherwise, God, I say, mention again, God doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need. If all people will become atheists, God will still have his domain of his world. And if all people are faithful, worship every night, there will be no increase in his, in his domain. So does God, when God says to worship me, recognize me, believe in me, what he wants is to make a community to respect your parents, to respect your elder, to respect your neighbor, to respect your younger, to respect your older, to make a loving community, be a good citizen, abide by the law, abide by the rules, to help out, you know, things like that. That's what Amir would teach. So I'm aware of Richard McKinney's plot to do harm to the mosque and its worshipers sh uh, shortly before his conversion to Islam and eventual presidency of the Islamic Center. So how was the community made aware of this incident? I, I do not remember the detail of it, but uh, after he accepted Islam, he told us the story. Uh, that, uh, his story is also amazing and unique, especially uh, for, uh, for you as audience. But to me, this similar story has happened even in the early days of Islam, when Prophet Muhammad was chosen by the Lord that he will be a prophet, there was, a, there was a, an Arab guy, very powerful. His name was Omar, Omar bin Khattab. Actually, Omar bin Khattab, somebody told him that, you know, there is a guy by the name of Muhammad. He is claiming that he is a prophet. Uh, and, you know, uh, he, he became very angry. He became angry. And he has his sword with him. And he was his sword with him. And he wanted to kill him. 
kill the prophet. He was on the way in the village to go and find him and kill him. So on the way, somebody asked him, Omar, why are you so angry? Where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going to kill this guy by the name Muhammad, that he thinks that he's a prophet. He's, you know, disrespecting our way of, uh, of living. And he told him, Omar, do you know or not? He said, what do you mean? He said, your sister is Muslim too. Yeah, he, he wasn't aware. He said, your sister is Muslim. So he turned around. He came to his brother-in-law's, to his sister's house. And when they saw him, he, you know, they were reading something, some verses from the Quran. This was in the early days, verses of the Quran. So they hide it and quickly. Uh, so he told them, you guys were reading. He heard something. He said, you were reading. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. There was nothing. He said, no, you were reading. You need to tell me the truth, what you were reading. Uh, then they admitted. Then he wanted to see them. His sister told him, you have to wash yourself first. Go and go to the bathroom, wash yourself, wash your hands, wash your nose. You know, before you read the Quran, you have to make ablution, we call it. You have to be clean. So when, when, he, cleared, when he was clean, then his brother-in-law or his sister read the Quran. And when he, she recited, that few verses uh, made him so influenced then he went to the Prophet Muhammad. He accepted Islam instead of killing Prophet Muhammad. So what I'm saying is, it reminds me of McKinney. I think his daughter was going to school, Yorktown, and Bibi's, one of Bibi's nieces were going to school. And I think his daughter also told her that there is, you know, some people different color or wearing scarf and he had been at that time to Middle East, he had all this hatred in Islam and things like that so, uh, you know uh, I think he didn't uh, he didn't weigh, I, he said he was sick of them there in Middle East now these people <laughs> came here and being even the classmate of his daughter so, you know, he kind of, I think, the way he told me, I, you know, maybe his interview will be more clarification, but just I want to give you the gist of it so that he become even more angry. He said he wanted to put, you know, to plot the bomb and things like that. But after, uh, you know, he, uh, he thought about it, and also I think the relation between his daughter and, and that thing grew up a little bit better or whatever, he, then he... Uh, I don't remember the exact detail, but then he was, he said he was trying to find a little bit, a little bit more about Islam. And I think at that time was, Jumu was one of our african American who got involved. Then he talked to me a little bit about it. And then we told him, you know, you come few times, you read about it, and then, you know, you don't have to right away accept Islam. And so then eventually he was impressed, and he finally, he gave the, the witnesses to become a Muslim, and not only a Muslim, he become a MSA president, uh, and then he will become the vice president of Islamic Center. Then after uh, the situation evacuated, he become even, uh, you know, the president of Islamic Center. And he did a great job, and we supported him all the way, and we still uh, love him. And we actually, when, when the remaining term was over, we uh, wanted to uh, ask him to run for the second time. But I believe because of his uh, schedule and his family, uh, he, he kind of declined it. Uh, but uh, his story actually reminds me of the early story of one of the campaign of the Prophet Muhammad. His name was Omar. So, but that, that's, that's another, t in my humble opinion, it's a, a, it's a miracle. From a religious standpoint, when you look at it, only God knows how things will, will turn around. You know, the guy who wants to bombard, bomb the Islamic Center is becoming a is Muslim himself. Then he become a vice president, head of the MSA, and then become a, 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 a president of Islamic Center. He's promoting Islam. He's promoting uh, our religion. He's, he's one of the, the best communicator with the non-Muslim community. So that's, uh, that, that is, uh, uh, you know, his story. But uh, I'm sure he uh, has been interviewed, so one can go directly to his part of interview to get the more accurate and more detailed description of how his story folded. So tell me about the decision to move the masjid to Hessler Road. 
to uh, to the present uh, location. Yeah, I, I, as I told you, we uh, were in Ball Avenue, which is a, a older area just north of uh, basket, uh, Basketball Arena. Uh, that was an old church, and it had a basement, and the basement will always get flooded, and a lot of bad smell will come. So it was pretty unhealthy situation, number one. Number two, early on, we started to raising money, and at that time, we had a... a quite few, uh, four or five physicians, uh, as I told you, some of them lived, you know, we had Dr. Ansari, God bless his spirit, he died, he was a plastic surgeon, he was one of our bigger donors. We had uh, another uh, uh, brother, uh, his name is Kabir, Saiful Kabir, he's a pulmonologist in Anderson, he was our biggest donor. We had some oncologists, we had a, 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 a a regular family physician, we had internal medicine, then we had some professor. So we tried to collect money. And after we had uh, collected six, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, and in the meantime, our community become a little bigger. So the space, place will become smaller, number one. Number two, it was not very healthy. Number two, the biggest one number, I remember one doctor, his name is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tarek Sheikh. He is now in Cleveland Clinic. He's pathologist, and his ex-wife, now they got divorced, his wife is Miriam Ibrahim. He told me one time, he said, Dr. Burami, I said, yes. He said, this is very pathetic. This was the word he used, that my children comes on Sunday school and, and have that smell. What kind of legacy we can give to our children that we are capable raising money, we are capable, we are doctors, we are making adequate money not to not to be able to have a little bit nicer, cleaner place. So uh, that was another uh, situation that energized us to collect money. And by 2000, I believe 2007, uh, we bought, uh, we were actually trying to build a place. There was a place behind Walmart and Lowe's, five acre land, we bought that five acre land. But later, uh, the problem was that that place is so much in hidden, and uh, and also there would be one entrance to it, so it will be behind the, some of their some other businesses. So we didn't like it, uh, so we finally sold that place, and uh, then we bought the present place, uh, which is uh, on uh, Hessler Road, 5141 uh, uh, West Hessler Road, which is on. 332, and you can see the sign from a distant uh, place. So, you know, this is a, a blessing for a small community uh, to have a center like this. And I believe you have seen the center. We have a big, uh, you know, basement. We have upstairs place for women. We have a place for men. We have a bathroom for men, bathroom for women. We have a library. We have a classrooms. We have, a, you know, uh, we even have an extra space to the north side that we are not using. We are trying to see if we can rent it, maybe to make like a, uh, someday, maybe even like apartment, or even maybe a, a, a babysitting place, or whatever people can use it. Or even if uh, there was one distant dentist, a young dentist who grew up here, uh, he's a dentist now, and he 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 showed some interest. We'll see. So so now we are very blessed with that nice place uh, and uh, uh, to enjoy. And also, it's a good enough place that you know the rest of the community can come and join us. Recently, we had a, a interfaith dinner. There's a lot of people uh, came, close to probably more than. Uh, you know, 150, 200 people, close to that number. I didn't count them, but it was full uh, of people, both women and women, uh, more eight, eight uh, different churches, Jewish community, other community came in and everybody spoke. It was very nice. So we are very humble to have that place. We are very thankful to the Lord uh, uh, to have that place. In 2017, members of the Islamic Center elected your wife, Bibi Barami, as the first woman president of the Islamic Center. So what's your response to this? Uh, <laughs> that, that, is, uh, that is another, uh, you know, another uh, uh, strong point. Like you have a McKinley, McKinney, who wanted to bomb, he became the president. And Bibi always have been the backbone of our community, always. 
because uh, because of BB, uh, uh, thanks God, I consider myself since I'm here now here most of other elderly people have gone. I I feel like consider we are the family of a Muslim community. We are like the father of the Muslim community at this point. And that is because of Bibi. Because Bibi has been very generous and very uh, excellent cook and she has a big heart. Uh, even though when I say I was president 15 years off and on, yes, I was president, but most of the work behind the curtain was done by Bibi. Because whenever a family would come in, we invite them to our house. Whenever in holidays, like we have a two Eid, one is after Ramadan, we have a big uh, festival. We would invite the whole community. I will stand up because having baby, I will stand up in the mosque. I said, all of you, regardless of color, white, green, black, and whoever we are, you are invited to my house. Poor, rich, whoever. And then the second Eid is the Eid when people go to pilgrimage. So we have done thanks God for years and years many different times, and other people have done it too, but we are the most one, and anybody who knew family come in, like recently there was a, some family came in from uh, Turkey, two new family, there was one from uh, 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 East uh, 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 Europe, uh, who has a, a, a nice uh, uh, restaurant here, they came, and uh, there were some other people, we invited them, to, to our house because we felt guilty of, of bad because we were be busy. It took a long time, but I, we still have them in mind to invite them to our house. So what I'm saying is that B.B. always has been in the forefront, but Aflin McKinney decided not to run and the time was right. I didn't want to do it again. I already have done mine. And we had some other people like uh, uh, Omar Benkatu, who was also interviewed by your group, uh, be part of that. He said he doesn't want it. We have another guy, Samir, uh, uh, he's from Egypt, very nice guy, he's get, he said he's getting older. So uh, uh, we asked Bibi and she was willing. She's a courageous woman. I was a little bit hesitant what, uh, uh, what other people, especially the Muslim would think. But thanks God, since they already know who Bibi is, she does not understand black and white. She does not understand rich and poor. She does not understand tall and short. She, honestly, she does not understand nice looking and bad looking women and men. She believes in God. She believes in people. And she said, I have, she has been uh, born in this world. She has one purpose to, to help and serve people. And she has been well taken, and since Bibi has taken over, the masjid looks cleaner and sophisticated, more carpets in the house, in the mosque, more nice signs in the park, more a better gathering in the mosque. Uh, even a few days back, we had a nice uh, rug, very expensive rug in my house that we have had it in our library at my home for many years. Bibi wanted to take that to the mosque. He said, this will look better in God's house. I said, hallelujah, let's take it. And we took it and she put it in the, in the library in the mosque. This is, this is who Bibi is. So not only as her husband, but as a member of this community, we are very pleased and we are very thankful to God that Bibi took this responsibility. I think hopefully a lot of community members will learn from this. And then uh, the other thing Bibi did was my oldest boy, Yusuf Bahrami, uh, he will be graduating from family practice residency. Uh, he will be joining uh, uh, here in Mansi called Open Door Clinic. We wanted him to come with us. But Yusuf Bahrami, my son, told me, he said, Dad, the open door clinic are very poor people and they don't have good doctors. Doctors come, they serve for six months and they leave. I want to work with them. I said, wow. Although my, my, all my group are very upset with me that why we didn't encourage my son to join American Health Network, AHN, where I'm working, and we wanted him to come because he does OB, you know, uh, you know, uh, delivering babies and things like that. So everybody was very excited. But he said, I want to work with, uh, uh, with Open Door Clinic. So what I'm saying is that BB also asked uh, Yusuf to be early on to bring him to the fold of Islamic Center. So he's our treasurer. 
And he promised me, he said, Dad, I said, yes, if he said nobody is helping Islamic Center, he said he will work harder to make extra money to pay the expenses of the Islamic Center for the years to come. I said, this brought tear to my eyes to have a son who has been raised here and he has that much courage and that much generosity and that much commitment that said, if nobody else will help, I will work extra, not only to raise, I'm so blessed to be a physician, to serve the, the weakest of the weakest community of Open Door and also to be the, the treasurer of Islamic Center to help out whatever financial he can do. He said, don't worry about it, Dad. You know, because I was concerned because not, we don't have too many people who can pay. He said, don't worry about it, I'm here. So this is who Bibi is, and this is who she has raised children like Yusuf. And, you know, she has raised six children. Most of it she did. I mean, I have done some part of it, you know, to take them to Islamic school, teach them, encourage them, you know, things like that. But most of the work has come from Bibi. So tell me briefly about uh, what, what's your experience living uh, in Muncie for the last 30 years? Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, as you know, I early uh, told you uh, in the interview that I came to Missouri as a refugee, then I went to Dallas to take my exams, which I passed it, but then I couldn't find residency. It took me almost two, three years. Then finally I found residency uh, coming to Muncie. So having coming to Muncie and having residency, even from the beginning, from the beginning, this was a blessing for me to have a, a job uh, as a as a family practice resident. So after I uh, felt comfortable, uh, after uh, uh, six months, uh, then I was almost uh, hundred percent assured that I am part of the residency. Uh, then I applied for my wife, and uh, she came. Uh, I, I joined the residency in June of 1985, and then my wife came in, uh, I believe, October, November, end of September of uh, 1986. I believe it was maybe November, because uh, we got uh, married in the 28th, so it was in November. So, uh, so this community is nothing but blessing. Uh, not only to me, now if we ask Bibi, my wife, what is the best place on this earth? Do you know what she would name it? She would say Mansi. She's not shy about it. She, as a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, sometime when we recruit uh, doctors from Farbal Memorial Hospital and sometimes professors for Ball State University, some people invite us to meet with those people, and especially Bibi, when, when we are having dinner with these recruiting uh, individuals to come here, uh, and Bibi talk to their wives, and she is the best convincing person to tell them how wonderful Mansi is, you know, especially for, you know, Muslim doctors or Muslim professor to come to Mansi. Uh, so, you know, we told you already about small Islamic center. So we were very blessed. Job-wise, uh, was excellent for me. After I graduated, I got a job here. Uh, I was part of uh, work with Dr. Cole, uh, with another doctor for uh, uh, three, four years. Then I worked with Ball Hospital, employee by Ball Hospital, uh, for almost 10 years, from 1995 uh, uh, to 2000. Uh, uh, to 2005, then I joined American Net Health Work, American American Net Health Work. So for last since 90, since 2005. So it's a, I am fine, uh, professionally I am doing very very well. Uh, I actually work like three doctors' job. I have a full practice. Then I was also. Uh, working in the hospital up to three years ago. I would see five, six, ten patients sometime early in the morning. Then I would go in the office and on Wednesday I am the medical director of four or five, five nursing home, uh, medical director of assisted living, Elmcraft. I am the medical director of hospice, uh, the medical director of uh, now recently of home health care. So, so as far as far as the 
professional satisfaction is a blessing. And the other blessing that comes out of this, that uh, uh, whatever money that comes out, uh, I have to share with the people that we left behind. And that, those are the people in Afghanistan, not only my relative, but my neighbors, and a lot of young people. And there's also a lot of children, especially women, who become widowed because their husbands died or were killed by Russians, by Soviet Union at that time. So uh, that part is, uh, uh, is excellent. Uh, so gave us Mansi, it's the Mansi community who, uh, and you know, basically the Lord who gave us this opportunity to be successful financially enough to help with the Muslim community, to help with the Islamic Center, to help with our large community, even in Delaware County, to be part of different organization, to be part of people to help with homeless, to be part of with the uh, people who are in need here in this, and to be also very helpful in, in um, in Afghanistan and other countries, uh, refugees of different countries. Uh, so this is all nothing but blessing. As far as my wife, when she came in first, so it was this community, it is this community who came to the, uh, to the rescue of my wife. My wife did not speak one word of English. Uh, and she didn't have any formal education. It was this community, some of it were my patients, some of it were my neighbors, so to teach BB from ABC. And it was this community to help us to provide with the adult education. It was this community that she graduated uh, uh, and got her GED. It was this community that she uh, attended uh, uh, Ivy Tech and then also become part of uh, uh, Ball State, and she got associate degree from Ball State University. So that is why BB is sold on this community. And it is this community that we feel comfortable. This is our second home. And BB, and maybe even for me you now, BB call it, she lived more in this community than in Afghanistan because she was 19 years old. Now she's almost 51 year old. So are 50 years old, 50, 51. So she lives almost 31 here, 31 years here in Mansi and maybe 19 years, not only in Afghanistan, 30 years, 13 years in Afghanistan and six years in Pakistan in the refugee camp. The, most of her life is here in Mansi and she is uh, uh, very well accepted. Uh, she. Uh, uh, is part of different organization. She has a very, uh, we both have a very strong relation with the Muslim community, as I told you, and we also have a strong relation with the uh, Ball State University, with the city of Mansi, with our African American community, both the Muslim community and the non Muslim community. And it was this community that inspired Bibi to, uh, uh, to, uh, develop uh, to make uh, an organization by the number of awaken Afghan women and kids and education and necessity and this community who came uh, uh, to her rescue to help her with this endeavor with this non for profit organization that now she is uh, she built a school in Afghanistan she uh, now we are running a uh, uh, a big clinic in Afghanistan that uh, minimum she is they are seeing 70, 80, 100 people daily. We have a, a vocational uh, 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 system in Afghanistan for women and children. We are uh, helping with a lot of scholarship, now probably close to 30 people. Uh, that we are giving scholarship to some people $75 per month, some people $50, some people $100, so they can go to school to not to join Taliban and also to help their families. So because of uh, being part of this community, believe in this community, so this community believe in, uh, believe in us and we appreciate this community. So our experience in this community is nothing but blessing, nothing but just enjoyment, I am nothing but lovable. The re remainder of our questions are going to focus on uh, you and the community's experience dealing with uh, national and international events. The first one I want to ask is, as a U.S. citizen now, how do you reconcile um, U.S. support for your fellow Afghan freedom fighters in the 1980s with knowledge that this 
contributed to the rise of the Taliban and, and Al Qaeda and the United States unfinished war in Afghanistan? Uh, that is a uh, uh, that is a uh, uh, five hundred <laughs> points loaded question. It's uh, uh, there are good memory and there's a bad memory. Uh, in the beginning, nobody thought nobody nobody thought that Soviet Union will leave Afghanistan. They said when whenever Russian Soviet Union at that time had gone to Eastern Europe at that time, Poland, uh, Yugoslavia, all were now those countries were even East Germany. They were satellite. They were satellite of of the Soviet Union. So when they invaded Afghanistan, nobody ever thought that Russia will get out of Afghanistan. But it was the Afghan people. It was the Afghan people who did not want to be. Uh, uh, run by the Soviet Union, and s most of it was not because the Afghan people always has been a courageous people. They are mountainous people. They always fought the the British. They fought the Mughal. They and in that case, they fought the the Soviet Union, the Russian. They started with the wood stick. They would make a gun look like a gun from wood stick. Try to fight them. So actually, the original fight started not because somebody gave us a weapon. I was part of that when I was with the freedom fighters. But once the West, especially the United, did see once once the West did see that the Afghan people are going to give sacrifice and they're not going to accept the communist communist regime. They will not accept the atheist regime of of uh, of, uh, of communism. Then. The help started. Uh, the help started. They gave us weapon and things like that. But still, the only time that the actually the balance become more equal are to the benefit of the freedom fighters when they gave us stingers. Uh, you guys were young when they gave us stingers. That was the first time that we could shoot their helicopter, Russians' helicopter, and they could see some damage. Before, it was like we were scratching their body. It, it didn't hurt them. They will continue to bombard, continue to kill us, continue to burn villages, continue to kill people. But once we started to hit there after the stinger that was given by, by the United, United States, that was the best help. And after that, the, the freedom fighters become much more upper hand, and that's why finally the Russians left in close to 1993. And from 1993 to 1996, uh, the, 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 the freedom fighters took over. But the unfortunate thing happened was, once the Russian left, all the Western countries, not only in the United States, but all the European countries, withdrew their help. The Afghan people, the freedom fighters, knew how to fight, but they did not know how to govern. They did not know how to govern. They did not know what to do, how to, how to take care of the people. So then they start fighting among themselves. When they start among themselves, then, the, then Pakistan took advantage of that. They raised or, or trained people by the name of Taliban, which called religious leader. And then they started from uh, from Kandahar, which is one of the provinces, try to raise people. Hey, these freedom fighters are corrupted people. They're fighting them. We are good people. And this is how Taliban came. And in the beginning, Taliban were supported by 100% by Pakistan, with Saudi Arabia, with England, English, you know, British, and the United States. Their blessing to bring Taliban in the forefront. As a matter of fact, uh, before bin Laden, uh, that the, the situation happened in the 9-11, some Taliban leaders did come to Houston to talk about oil, to talk about gas that coming from Turkmenistan. These are Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, are, were some of the satellite uh, provinces or state of the Soviet Union, but Turkmenistan was one of the countries has a lot of gas and things like that. So, but after the Bin Laden, you know, blew up the the towers, and then the United States wanted Bin Laden, and the Taliban wouldn't give them. Then that's why the United States went to, you know, uh, 
uh, get rid of the Taliban regime in 9-11. So in a nutshell, in a nutshell, uh, it was very much appreciated the help of Americans, of the United States, by supporting the freedom fighters without their support will be almost impossible, especially without the stingers. That changed the, the, the power of the fighting or the balance of the fighting. But then the bad thing what happened when the freedom fight took over, they washed their hands, all the Western countries left Afghans to fight among themselves. And then that made the opportunity with the help of British, of Saudi government, of even America to bring Taliban to, that was another atrocity that what the Taliban committed in Afghanistan to not allow children to school, especially girls, and you know, that situation. But after Bin Laden, after 9-11, then the Taliban, uh, you know, were defeated. But unfortunately, the fight, as you know, is still going on. But I will leave it at that. You mentioned a few times the 9-11 attack. What do you remember about uh, the September 11th attack? 9-11 was, uh, uh, was amazingly a very scary, uh, uh, frightening experience, frightening situation. I was in Golden Living Center, one of the nursing homes that I go to. Uh, and I believe it maybe it was Tuesday morning. I don't remember, but I thought it was 9 o'clock or whatever time was that I could see that I heard the news. Uh, so, uh, and we have heard at that time, or we had heard of Japanese American that were put in camps. And that was the first thought in our mind that that would be happening. And few days after, uh, even the, the, the FBI came to my office. So somehow, I don't know whatever happened, because we always try to help uh, our own family on a, at that time there was no awaken awaken came after 9 11 uh, you know the organization that my wife and I you know we 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 made it so even if bi came to my office and then there were rumors that dr bahrami is uh, have a, a ship loaded of weapons <laughs> heading toward afghanistan and you know, and we were one of those people, uh, anti-Americans and things like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a lot of rumors that I was already put in jail. You know, here in Muncie, it was amazing. Uh, then uh, the newspaper uh, uh, did interview two of the physicians. One was Dr. Sanger, and one was another, uh, Dr. Turner, female. Uh, a physician that I knew them very well from, uh, to talk to them about me, and then this newspaper came out. But actually, the FBI did just came and ask some question. But I'm sure there were some other people who were frightened, you know, by every and any Muslim when they saw. So it was a it was a very scary moment, uh, and uh, uh, in any situation, for all of you young people to learn any scary situation, any bad situation that occurs, try not to lose your temper, try not to lose your spirit, try to continue to be courageous and be patient. Because any bad situation, sometimes good things will come out of it. From 9-11, one of the good things came out of it, it, it woke up the Muslims. So the Muslims to become more involved in the community, not only in Mansi, but everywhere else, to get out of their mosques, out of their Islamic center to get involved in their community, to get involved in the churches, to get involved in their neighborhood. And Amir Shabazz was also very influenced uh, in this, how to keep us our spirit up and to tell us, you know, look, you cannot, you, you cannot lose your spirit. You know, this is the country of law. This is the country of order. This is the country of, of, of rules and regulation. If, if you have not committed any crime, do not be scared. We have to stand up, we have to stand tall. Yes, Ben Laden did who, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of Christians doing major, major crimes. A lot of Jewish has crime. Look at Palestine. They have taken over of the country. You know, the Christian, for example, when it comes to Holocaust, who committed the Holocaust? It was Christian. It was, uh, uh, 
uh, the Germans, it was the Nazis, it was the Hitler. He was born in Christian, he was a Muslim. So he killed Jewish. Then, since the Christian, the English and all, they had a power, they take the Jewish people, give the place of Palestine for them. So what I'm saying is, so Amir Shabazz always helped us with this. So uh, the good thing came out, we came out of our shell to be part of the larger community. But obviously, you know, after that, when I would go to Afghanistan, I will be checked twice. When I come back from Afghanistan, FBI will uh, take me to a room, will be asking me questions, where did you go? Who did you meet? Who did you do it? You know, so we, we did go through that kind of a trouble. Uh, not everybody, but some of the prominent people or some of the people they suspected or whatever they had. As a matter of fact, one thing I did was after 9-11, I went to the FBI and I told them in their eyes, very clear cut in the office in Muncie, that I have a lot of poor family in Afghanistan and I have been helping them. I gave them their names. I gave them the whole list of my relatives and the poor people in the neighborhood that these people I'm sending money that you guys need to know. So make sure there's no, you know, vicious people to, to, to spy on me and because of that. I'm going to help there, my family, and I will continue to help. And I gave them the list of those people for, to the FBI that these are the people that I'm helping to make sure there's no misunderstanding. So if 9-11 uh, was very frightening for Muslim, and it brought to our, to, our, to our domain the feeling of Japanese Muslim, uh, but, uh, you know, luckily we, we went through it and good things came out of it. As a matter of fact, Pence was our congressman at that time. And we met with him, five, six of us, in the uh, Anderson Country Club. And start this, this Pence, he's very prejudiced man and he's very extreme. Instead of telling us, you know, this is the country of law, this is the country of the United States. This is a civilized country. Don't worry. If you have not done anything wrong, well, don't worry. Instead of telling us this, do you know what he told us? He told us, he said, you pray that maybe another episode like this doesn't come. Means if another situation comes, another 9-11, means you guys will be slaughtered. I mean, that was his body language. Was. This is the Pence, who is now the vice president, which I have no respect for him. He called himself religious. There is no dot of any religiosity in his heart. He is nothing but prejudiced man. So, so that that was about 9/11. Do you think that the atmosphere uh, around the Islamic Center after 9/11 is comparable to the atmosphere after the 2016 election? Uh, no, I mean <laughs> the 9/11 was uh, scary. I forgot about that because. Uh, on the sick, uh, this happened, I believe, in Tuesday, the first Friday after 9/11 happened. Look at look at the 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 generous people, not people like Pence, but the common men like you and others, the religious, true religious people, the churches. Many people from churches came and they circled our Islamic center. They circled and they told each one of us, "You go and pray." with comfort. We are standing outside. We will monitor your church and we will support your church. We will prevent any bad guys coming inside. You pray, do your prayer. These were the people that came after 9-11. So that 9-11 was, that was our first episode, was very scary. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Trump is concerned, I think this uh, originally we knew that Trump is a very ignorant man. He's very arrogant. Uh, although he called himself uh, uh, maybe a religious man or maybe a conservative, but he is none of those. Uh, he doesn't have uh, the true heart of human being in his heart. He is a very prejudiced man. So we thought he will not be even uh, elected for to be the nominee of, uh, of a Republican. I wrote an article during that process, I think you guys need to look at it. I don't remember uh, the exact month. I wrote a very nice small article and wrote uh, a letter to, uh, to uh, Trump. I said, I believe in American people. I believe in my neighbors. I believe in these civilized people. They will never, never elect a person like you. 
that's a, a hurting. And in the end, he was elected. But one thing was good, I was still true to my uh, letter because he was not, you know, the, he didn't win the popular vote. So what I'm saying is was, we were a little bit scared, but we didn't think he will win. So that year went by, then we didn't think that he will be elected as a president. Then we were hoping that he will not be as prejudiced as he claimed, maybe he just wanted to become president. But when we saw him now, so the only thing uh, in his situation is, it is extremely, maybe more scary than 9-11. Because 9-11 was one episode, it happened, it happened, 3,000 more people got killed, and you know, then we got out of our shell, that benefit came, but well, this will be uh, what his danger is, Trump's danger, he's mobilizing that the 30 plus, our ignorant, wonderful Americans, who are not educated, who are less educated, he is mobilizing to make them more prejudiced against, you know, black, against all minority, especially to pick on first on a Muslim. I was in one group, I when there was one even a Jewish people also, I told them, you know, if you don't come to rescue for the Muslim, believe me, when they eradicate Muslim, you know, Trump and his people, if they eradicate Muslim, the next time will be Jewish, the next time will be Catholic, the next time will be black. So, you know, he does not believe in diversity. He is, he has an extreme ideology. I don't know what his ideology, whether he's reading Nazi books or whatever his God knows, but the way he has no spirit of Christianity in his heart, zero in my humble opinion. And he is all, to be very frank with you, he is all, he wants to see this country all what one color. That's what my understanding is. And he does not listen to very, very noble people. You know, how many people with his administration, he's f firing them right and left, and they're all good citizens. Anybody, good person, he give him a good, common suggestion that is, that is American suggestion, that is good for whole America. He, he does not accept that. He wants to fire those people. He wants only have to puppet in his way. So, so Trump's situation is extremely scary, not only for Muslim like me, but for all minority, for the Jewish, for the black, for the Catholics, for others and others and others. And that's unfortunate that the American, the America that I know, the American people that I know, to be represented by a man like Trump, I'm scared for my grandchildren when, he, when they hear his language, his foolish language, his uncivilized language, what my children and grandchildren will learn from the President of the United States, where the whole world respect the presidency, respect the dignity of, of, of Americans, respect the generosity of Americans, respect the civilization of America, respect the human rights of, uh, he only support dictators. Anybody who is for the civilization, he doesn't want to do anything with them. If you really look at his, his dealing, he only loves dictators. You know, look at, he congratulating Putin. His hand is, Putin's hand is bloody. You know, what he did to our, our election and what he's doing to his own people, what he did to Crimea, what he is doing in Syria, killing people, killing, and he's congratulating Putin. So this is our President Trump. It's unfortunate. What are your hopes for the future? Uh, my hope for the future is I'm hoping those 30% supporters of America to eventually to see the light, the true light, and to look at the Constitution, to look at the American, true American values of generosity, as I mentioned, of education, of open arm, loving their neighbors, loving God's people, I hope they will see the light. And I'm also hoping and praying to Almighty God that our other country, the true other Americans, that the 70 other person also to become mobilized, to keep this country as it has been, their constitution, 
to really rally to never, never elect a person like President Trump to destroy the beauty of the constitution of this country, the beauty of the society of this country. So uh, I'm hoping that the common sense will prevail. And I'm also hoping the religious people, the true religious people, the churches, the synagogue, the, 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 the mosque, come rally together to look at for the human value for the human value, to look at for the diversity. We are all God's people. We all belong to this world. This earth is our shared home. To see that vision, to see that vision, earth is our home, is our common home. To, to look, you know, look at, look at, to look at the Jesus, what Jesus did, the true Jesus, what he has done to the poor, what he has done to the sick. What, I'm hoping that people will see that true version of Christianity and in the true vision of the civilization of, as I mentioned, of the true spirit of the American people to come to go back to that spirit and get rid of him at the second term. I hope even in, in the midterm to, 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 to curtail some of his aggression. And I'm hoping he himself, God will, I'm hoping and praying to God to guide him to guide him to truly represent this beautiful country, to guide him to, to, to be a true American citizen, to be a true human being to his family, to the whole United States as American president. We want to pray for him to be the right person, the good person. Everybody can change. He can change. But I hope he asks for the change, for the good. If not, we, the Americans, have to change and go back to the original, true American spirit, not this bigotry. In closing, I, I want to just get to the heart of what it means to be a Muslim in America, and, I mean, in America to you. So I want you to take some time and think about one story or event from your life that really captures what it means to you to be a Muslim in America. And you can take as much time as you need Gosh, this is a, a very loaded, loaded question. It 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 thinks a lot. It needs a lot of thinking and thoughts. Uh, uh, one thing that comes uh, to my mind uh, is I love this country because I truly can worship in my own way more freer more free here in this country in any other place on the face of this earth. I want to tell you that. Because I, you know, there were episodes like 9-11 and things like that. Beside those small episodes, Martin, I really free, feel free by my own willing. Because in some Muslim countries, sometimes you will be ashamed of, uh, of other Muslims or of the preachers or of the society you know, to practice your religion. The beauty of this country, nobody has to see me. I don't have to go to mosque. Nobody will tell me, oh, Dr. Barami, you didn't go. I, I will not be here. So this is on my own willing to go. But this country, this society, provide me this opportunity, that spirit of freedom and my own will to practice my religion to practice who I am, who I am. As a Muslim American, especially from my religious standpoint and from also from this society, to be, to be well established and to do what I want to do. I always wanted to help from, from childhood. This was one of my spirit to help others. And the Lord, Allah, God, whatever you want to call it, one God, has provided me this opportunity, and America has provided me this opportunity to fulfill what I always wanted to do even as a child. And now I can do this. So this is the spirit of freedom, the freedom of justice, the, the freedom of, of the wrong and the correct. Like recently, in Carmel, Indiana, which is not far away, some citizen were trying to block not to build mosque where on the same road there were three four churches but eventually the common sense prevailed and they gave them 
The zoning committee gave them the permission. So this is the America that I want. And this is the America that I love. So there is a law, there is a rule, there is a regulation, and the common man, the common American, get the common wisdom. The common wisdom, eventually. So I believe in this country. I think this country will hopefully, with all you young people that you are sitting in front of me, will prevail to bring the true feeling, the true spirit, the true generosity, the true education, the true loving of, of, of God's world, and the true leadership, to take the leadership of the world, to take the leadership of civilization, to take the le leadership of human rights, which Trump have no regard, that will come. The second thing to tell you about the beauty as a Muslim American to appreciate this community is my wife, who came illiterate to this country. And now she is the leader, not only in Muncie, in Delaware County, in Indiana, in America, but leader in Afghanistan, leader and generosity in Syria, in Africa, and other. This is, this is the doing of this society. This is the doing of America. This is the doing of people like you. This is the society that I love. This is the society I love by my heart and by my feeling. And I hope and pray that all of you young people, you young people, not to be citizen of, of, of Muncie, citizen of Indiana, citizen of America, but to be citizen of the world, to bring someday, whether I live or not, whether I'm here on the face of this or not, that you will have a world of peace that all races, all colors, will live in harmony one day without fighting, without getting into each other's throat, and to have peace on this face of this earth, then God will be extremely happy and satisfied with us. Thank you, Dr. Baromi. You're welcome. On behalf of the Virginia B. Ball Center Seminar, Muslims in Muncie, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us today. I appreciate uh, all you students, young people who are sitting in front of me, maybe the camera is not seeing you, but I'm seeing you. I appreciate, I appreciate Ball State University, I appreciate, I appreciate this community, but my personal advice to all of you, as my own like nephews and nieces who are sitting in front of me, to continue to believe in yourself, believe in your cause, believe in hard work, believe in your spirit, and believe in the Lord, whatever way you believe, to do good anywhere you can, in any place you can, in any time you can, and have the courage that you can do it. Never say you cannot do it. You will fall, you will fail one time, but you need to get up again and again, and you will see the success. It will come, and I believe in you. Thank you very much. God bless all of you.